Well, good morning, everybody. Or good evening. Happy 4th of July to uh, anyone in the US. Um, welcome to another edition of VFX Live, Houdini version, Houdini special. This is uh, episode 23, I think. Amazing. Um, we're just going to keep going today with the project that we've been working on, the Spaceship Rising. Um, so, hey, Hardik, how's it going? I'm good, thank you. How are you? Hey, Rizwan. Nice to see you. Um, so yeah, you know, we'll, we'll jump in and I'm just actually writing, writing out a simulation of the ship. I started it about, well, 25 minutes ago, it looks like. Um, and it's, it's kind of almost done. I'm not going to let it go all the way. The one thing that I remembered, uh, or that I realized after I went to write this to disc at the end of last week's stream was that. I forgot to turn viscosity on. <laughs> so I did, I think I mentioned this in the comments just to anyone that was following along. Um, yeah, I created viscosity attributes and I did this SOP solver stuff with the viscosity, but I actually forgot to uh, enable it on the solver, which was silly. So it was doing nothing, nothing was, nothing was working, but uh, I've turned that on now. And as you can see, it no longer runs over the edge like it used to. Does it ever snow in Australia? Uh, yes, it does. Rizwan, it does snow here. It doesn't snow where I am. I, I live near the um, near the beach. It is really cold here at the moment, but um, it does snow in the mountains. Definitely, um, lots lots of snow in the mountain mountain areas. Definitely gets very cold, and there's good good skiing and snowboarding if you're into that sort of thing. So yeah, you know, this is kind of working a little bit better now. One change I made with that viscosity, if we have a look uh, inside the dot network, was that uh, when I did this first, I didn't have this one here setting it to zero because what that would mean is that as the ship rises away from this area, the viscosity would just stay with the ship. And I thought that was maybe what I wanted, but actually, it kind of makes more sense to have the viscosity be reset to zero um, and, you know, be able to fall down like water until it hits the water surface and slide around. Hey, Ivan, how's it going? Uh, can we ride kangaroos? No, no, we cannot. Um, they, they wouldn't like that. They wouldn't like that one bit. And they're not that big, you know, it'd be very difficult to, to get on a kangaroo. Uh, all right, so I've got... I've got a previous version that I wrote out, which is version two, which is maybe going to be a little bit different, but not too different. So you can see here, now it's not, well, it's almost at the edge there. So I think I, I think I maybe tweaked a few things to try and fix that, but that's kind of okay. Now let's have a look what we've got. We've got our particle streams and we've got our ship. So I think this is looking pretty good. You know, this ship rising scene. Hey, thanks, Ivan. Um, but, you yeah, know, there's a few more things that we can definitely do. I think, um, you know, potentially adding a bit of pyro to it might be interesting to see what, you know, what that kind of looks like. Uh, it, I don't know what sort of spaceship it is, Rizwan. The, um, the link to this spaceship is in the, uh, in the description. I posted it in the comments a couple of weeks ago, but uh, it should be in the description now. It's just one that we that we bought off CG Trader um, for another project, and I thought I would reuse it, reuse it for this one. It's pretty cool, pretty cool model. It's got lots of detail. Be a nice uh, a nice ship to blow up as well. Be cool kind of thing to uh, to explode, which we could look at in a different stream. So yeah, I, you know, I think this is looking okay. I think last week we were sort of starting to look at rendering, which is good. Um, and we need to work on our ocean surface quite a bit for rendering. Another thing that, you know, I was potentially going to look at was to take my ship. So I've got my flip here, which is, you know, this one, which is kind of the surfacing effect and particles running down the surface of the ship. And then I've got my particle streams as well, which are very kind of perfect streams. But I thought I might also try this 
version with flip. So I have everything that I need really. I have this kind of, you know, these points on the ship. Got my pop net, which is sort of running on a static version of the ship. So it's very light. There it is. But I thought I might attempt this with flip as well. So what we could do is I might just, uh, let's see, where's my flip solver? I might just copy this over here and I'll plug in my points there. I'm just going to go inside my pop net and grab this static object here and replace it. Because this one is animating, this one's updating, it also has the ocean surface on it, so uh, I might get rid of that for a moment, and I'll replace this BGO, or this, uh, sorry, static object with this one. So this is the static ship. Let's have a look at our volume, our flip sort of container, let's just pull this down. So I'm going to do a similar thing with the particles where I just have a static emitter and a static collider and then I'll transform it after the sim. So I'll get rid of my slop solver, I'll turn off viscosity and we've got our pop drag and our pop force. This is just sourcing from the first context so if I hit play here I should get something. Let me just see. So I've got viscosity off, surface tension I might turn off for now. Uh, reseeding's off. Okay, let's see what happens. So we just have single points emitting. So we should get something kind of similar to what we had with pops, but it, because it's flip, it should be um, yeah, a bit more flippy. So let's see what, see what it looks like. I hope everybody's uh, having a good good weekend. Anybody working on interest, anything interesting in Houdini at the moment? Love to uh, love to hear what you guys are up to. Play this a bit more. So you can see we don't have any noise in here. Like in the pop version, we had some noise to kind of create the flip sort of look. But this one actually just gives it to us for free because it is flip. It's a little bit slower to solve, but it's a nice, you know, you get some nice details. Now, I think these tiny little streams, you know, could benefit from being increased a little bit. So what I'm going to do here is put a pop replicate down. Pop replicate. Does my ship have a landing gear? Uh, I don't know, Rizwan. I have not... Uh, oops, point replicate. Uh, I have not looked. We can we can have a look. Let's have a look. I don't think it's that kind of ship, really. It's more of a... Uh, I think if this ship tried to land, it would... Um, it would damage these little bits. No landing gear, by the looks of it. You'll have, to, uh, you'll have to write that in the comments to the uh, person who modelled it, that maybe it should have a landing gear. Uh, Alright, so let's create a sphere here, and I'll just shrink this down, so that I get little, little kind of spheres around each point, like that. And then, because that's kind of going to be quite a bit more inflated and potentially go through the ship, what I'm going to do here is put a ray down and ray these points back onto the surface of the ship. So here's our static ship here. Put a ray and ray minimum distance. And you can see, if I turn off the guard geometry, that that sort of collapses those points down onto the ship's surface. So should actually flatten them. It's weird actually what's going on there. I think there's a lot of planes there, so it's sort of... Um, Collapsing it onto each other. Well, that's kind of strange. I don't know why it's doing that because it doesn't look like there's actually a plane there Maybe minimum distance is not uh, It's not the best thing to do there. I don't know. It's weird. The other thing we could do is just put a peak down Here these should have normals. Hopefully. Let's see No, they don't. Why don't they? Oh, there's a peak here. Look Oh, so they do have normals there, but for some reason, oh, turn recompute off, there we go. So there we go, you can push those out, so we already are doing that a bit here, but we can push them out even further, 
given that we're adding a little sphere onto them, if we push them out even further and then ray onto the surface. Oh, there we go, that's working a little better. So now they're kind of being created off the surface and then being flattened back on. So, yeah. Uh, I would say that a land speeder, if you're talking about the Star Wars one, probably has, you know, it's probably quite a different ship, so maybe it needs a, la a uh, landing gear. It's also, you know, not not a outer space ship, it's more of a along the ground type thing. Uh, Alright, but you could try something like this with, with your land speeder model, or this one. Could be pretty cool. So you can see now what we've got, instead of having lots of little dots, we've got lots of little sort of circles of points. Each one has a hundred points, maybe we don't need that many. We could, you know, sort of control how many we get there. But what that's going to give us in our flip simulation is a much larger emitter surface. And it's going to produce you know, more water and more interesting shapes probably, just because there's a lot more surface for that, you know, to kind of travel along the ship and just all that extra fluid will, will make it feel a bit more interesting. Let me take the resolution down a little bit. I'll just do times two here. So that now will be 0.1. And the first time I saw somebody doing this was when, uh, when I first went to double negative and I just sort of started learning Houdini or using it. And uh, I saw people doing this and I was like, why would you do that? Why don't you just make it 0.1? But what I've realized over time is that it actually is really handy to do that because it keeps your high resolution settings and you can just go, well, I just want to, I just want to run this quickly. And, you know, then I want to go back to my high res setting at some point, but I might forget what that high res value was. So by just going, yeah, I'm going to do, you know, 0.05 times four, that'll give me 0.2. So I get a much lower resolution simulation, but at any point I can just get rid of that and jump back to my high res. So it actually is really handy to do that. And, and I do that quite a bit, especially with resolution based things like voxel size or particle separation. Um, it's quite handy just to keep that original high res value there and multiply it up over time. So what do we got? Let's see, There's some interesting things happening. When you have a larger particle separation, you can see like the particles get drawn together a lot more. They kind of stick together. We do have no surface tension, so it's just the it's just the particle size that's kind of controlling that suction that we're getting there. Maybe these circles are a little large, you know, might be a little big. Let's jump look through our camera view. But you can see it just it gives a different feeling to um to the, the flip or to the streamers, you know, the pulp ones are very linear, very fine, but these ones, you know, may work as just a thicker kind of thing. Um, Hardik, just finishing up destructions, working on waterfall. Ah, cool. Yeah, it'd be good to see, be good to see some flip stuff, Hardik. Flip's a lot of fun, time consuming, but, but it is a lot of fun. Uh, my weekend was good. Thanks for asking. It's very busy. Didn't, wasn't on my computer very much, but, um, but yeah, it was good. It's very cold here. It's freezing. It's raining a lot too, but, um, yeah, it was good. How's your weekend, Hardik? Is it, mo it's Monday for you, isn't it? All right, let's see what this is looking like. So, let's see. So we're not getting loads of detail and that's probably just down to the particle separation of 0.2. But you can see some interesting kind of things happening. Interesting things happening on the surface. We're getting a lot of points in here, which makes me think that maybe we're just emitting too many points. Let's try taking this down. Let's go to 10 and see, see what that looks like. There we go. It's a lot faster now as well, which is kind of good. We probably don't need quite so many as well. You know, we've got our flip ones, which are kind of doing everywhere. We've got our dragging up as well happening. So perhaps, perhaps we do this off of uh, a smaller scatter or we could just cull some of these points. So 
I've done this a few times in various streams, but let's do it again. So I'm going to say if rand at, whoops, at ptnum, can't see my keyboard past my microphone, um, Monday here, very hot here, summer, yeah, opposite side of the world, can't wait for summer. Um, so if random PT nums, basically what I'm doing is creating a random number for every point. And it's going to be, it's always between zero or one when it comes out of a random. So if rand at PT num is greater than, uh, create a channel and call it threshold. So that's going to create a little float slider below when I hit the button. So if the random number is greater than the threshold, I want to remove point zero for the first input. So we only have one input, which is the first one, which is zero. So that's what that is. And then we're just going to run that over all point numbers. So any that satisfy this condition will get removed. Close that off, hit the create spare parameters button. And you can see now we have this threshold slider. And as I Slide that, oh, looks like I forgot one of my brackets. There we go. You can see as I slide that, so as I slide it up, none of the points get removed. And as I bring it down, it removes. And I go all the way to zero. So the way this works is each point has a random number on it. And as I go up to one, no points will have a number greater than one on them. So no points get removed. When I'm at 0 0.5, statistically, you know, half of these points will have a value that's greater than 0 0.5. So half of them get removed. If we have a look at what we had previously, we have 1200 points. And if we have a look at what we have now, we have 576. So a little more than half, but uh, roughly half. Hey, Audrey, how's it going? Welcome. Um, so you can see that, you know, it works pretty well because, because the distribution of randomness over all the points is kind of spread out. Each one just gets a different random value. It's a really nice way of doing an overall kind of reduction of points. And it sort of does it everywhere rather than just in specific areas. So this is a really good way of just culling points. So I could do something like that. Like we're left with 28 points there instead of 1200 and now run that through our creation of our little spheres, reset our simulation. And now we've got much faster simulation as well, but much, you know, fewer areas where these points can get emitted. How's your, how's your weekend, Audrey? Is it, is it hot over where you are as well? I've heard it's, uh, it's crazy hot in Canada and the U S at the moment, probably everywhere in the Northern hemisphere, maybe. Hey, Alan. How's it going? Thanks for joining us. Um, all right, so what am I gonna do? I'm gonna take the res, because it's running quite quickly now, I'm gonna take the res back down, or well, back up. Particle separation down, increases resolution, down 0.05. Super stormy too. Oh, cool, I like summer storms. They're, they're pretty epic. I, uh, I really like sort of tropical storms where it's kind of hot and very stormy and rainy. It's pretty, pretty exciting. Um, all right, so you can see with a greater resolution, you know, we get much more detail coming out of these streams. Oh, one thing that will help, see how these are kind of just very straight lines that we're getting? What will help with that is if we actually change the seed of the point replicate. So if you go to shape, you can see how if I scrub the seed, it changes the distribution of points that we get here. So if I just put dollar $F in there, every frame, I'm gonna get a different seed value because that's the frame counter. So you can see as I change that, I get a different sort of distribution of points and that will stop that, uh, that, that streaming happening, those individual lines that get created because they're the same point over and over again. This is gonna have different points every frame so you can see that line just becomes much more broken up now. And that will help overall with detail and with variation in our flip sim. 
you can see, you know, we get much greater kind of variation in those emissions now. Much more wiggly lines and things just being a little bit more broken up. Probably we can take this particle separation down even more. And, and when I would be doing this, you know, at a high resolution, I'd probably go down to 008. Seems to be a pretty good um, low particle separation. Um, <laughs> cool. Glad, glad, uh, glad you're enjoying it, Alan. Just, just, um, if you weren't here at the start, I'm just basically taking what I was doing with the particles, creating those streams, but running it through flip instead. I haven't really done anything to the flip. I've just left it kind of as it was. I just copied the flip solver and, um, yeah, you know, it's just, uh, just seeing if we can get like slightly more detail from some of these, some of these particle um, streams, and it's again doing it on a static ship makes it nice and easy. We don't have to worry about animated um, collision geometry, and then we can rise this up at the end. So you can see we're getting some nice, nice sort of pouring off details here. The other thing that we could do is actually reduce the points over time, so it's not like a constant. You know, it's a bit of a it's a bit of a tap at the moment. Things pouring out. It's actually you know it's not too bad, but we could always just turn those off at certain point. You know that that could be a way just to stop it from completely pouring out everywhere. I'm liking what's happening here. I kind of want more of that at the top of the ship. So perhaps we'll just play with our little attribute angle here. The other thing we could do is just add a value to our random. So we could add a integer channel called seed. Promote that. And now we have a, you can see when I change this, it changes the random seed. So I actually get points in different places. So that could be another option as well, just to go, oh, I don't like that distrib, I like that amount of points, but I don't like that distribution. You could change the seed to get points in different places. I think I'll give it a few more points overall. And this point replicate as well will take a P scale. So at the moment, all these spheres are the same size that are being generated, but I could actually give this a P scale value. So let's set that to one. And in here, I'm going to say uh, at P scale equals, so I'll just test it 0 0.1. They should all shrink. Good. Let's do random at PT9 again. So that should give me between zero and one. There we go. Some of them should be quite big, but they all look relatively small, but you can see there's variation now, but I'm gonna put that in a fit so that I can control that. So fit, whoop, fit zero one, let's go between 0 0.05 and 0 0.2. There we go. And we can always control this as well as like an overall multiplier on that value. Yeah, Canada's uh, sounds like it's incredibly hot and, and parts of North America. Um, crazy, crazy temperatures, record breaking temperatures, scary. Every, every year I sort of, you know, I think a lot of people in Australia, we just sort of tentatively wait for summer and see what it'll bring because sometimes it can be just incredibly hot and sometimes it can be quite mild, especially where I am down south in Australia. Um, it can, summers can be you know, relatively mild. Some summers can be unbearably hot and uh, they create a lot of bushfires, which are scary. Australia. Are you, is, does that say Australia? Australia. <laughs> hey Max, how's it going? Um, thanks for joining me. I haven't, I haven't seen you for a while, Max. Welcome. Uh, let's go and see how this is looking. Paris can get super hot too. Yeah, it can. It can definitely. Yeah, parts of Europe can get incredibly hot, especially as you go further south. Can be nice sometimes. 
I like it when it's hot and then it gets cool again very quickly, but when you get an extended heat wave, it can be just incredibly exhausting. Alright, so, yeah, this is, yeah, this is getting there. I think it's kind of looking okay. There's, some of these streams are a little bit, um, it's a bit hard to zoom to this. These ones are a little bit kind of just, you know, a bit not great. One thing we could do here, it's always good to have options. So what I'm going to do here on these points is I'm going to say at ID equals at PT num. And that way, what I will have, actually, I'll call it, um, I'll call it something different than ID because Flip also uses the ID attribute. I'm going to call this stream ID. And what that's going to do is give each point before I point replicate it an ID value, which is the same as point number. But as soon as I add the point replicate, the point number changes. But that stream ID has been created before, so it'll be good. It'll be good. So what, um, what we'll get when we do that, it's the same result. It's not going to change anything. We'll reset, but we'll have this attribute present on our points. So let's let it run for a little bit. That should be enough. I'm going to put a dop import down here so I can just grab my flip because I'm seeing the ship as well. So I'll drag my dop network up here. Uh, dop node flip object. Yeah, winter, winter is nice. Winter is nice. Uh, all seasons are nice, as long as they're not too extreme, I think, you know. Um, whoops. Accidentally clicked on the full-size camera button. Um, surprise. All right, so here's my points. And you can see I've got... Where is it? It's not there. What? Ah, point replicate is deleting it attributes, copy source attributes, there we go, stream ID, okay, let's try again, reset, top import fields, uh, there it is, stream ID, so what we can do is put a color node down here, just to visualize, um, you know, what we can do with this, if I put stream ID in here, what you'll see is that I actually get a random color per stream. You know, if this was just based on ID, I would get a random color per point, potentially. Or not at all. Um, but if I do this based on PTNUM, for example, actually, I don't think PTNUM and ID work in this context. Um, but if you did it in, in uh, VEX or in a VOP, that would work. But yeah, basically, you just get a random color like this. You just get a random color per point. But by creating that stream ID, what we get is a value per stream, which would allow us to be able to delete streams or vary things like vary p scale per stream. So yeah, we can, you know, it's good to have that stuff so that we can make choices. Like for instance, these, these ones here, I don't particularly like, so I could delete that based on its stream ID, for example, if I went in and had a look at that. So if I, there are a few ways to kind of figure out what that ID might be. You could create a marker like this, create a marker for stream ID and then zoom into that stream and find out that it is stream 1154. So I could put a blast down and say at stream ID equals 1154 points and it's gone. So I got rid of that one. The other way that you could do it is, let's say we now want this one, is to choose select points, select this one and go to your geometry spreadsheet and view only show selected and then just hide all attributes and grab your stream ID. And you can see now I'm seeing uh, the 674 is the stream ID. So I could then go back to my blast and maybe do Stream ID equals 674. Oops. And that one's gone now. So that can be another way of figuring out which, you know, which thing you have. That only show selected is quite handy. 
just shows you, you know, only the thing that you had selected, so you can focus on that. Uh, so dot import field Hardik is it is different to dot io. Dot i like the io part of dot io refers to in out. So if you have a look at dot io, it has the ability to save to disk. Uh, so it is basically just a dop import field inside with a rop geometry out and a file. So I just don't use that because I usually like to have those things separate. So I like to have a dop import field and then a file cache, just like I have here, you yeah. know, like that. So I don't use dop.io, but um, that's all it is. You know, you just know that it's a dop import fields is the node that it's using. And that's where all this dot net, dot node and presets and import stuff comes from. And then you've got, you know, a file cache basically and a file read. That's, that's all the difference is. Um, so I've got that stream ID on there now. That's, you know, that's handy to have. Um, let's, you know, let's let it run a little more. Go back into the simulation and just see what we've got. All right, I mean, we don't need to, you know, we don't need to labor over it. This one, I think, you know, the it's all kind of clear what, what I'm doing here. And it's very similar to everything that we've done before, but it's just another way of getting more detail out of the streams. You can see it's different to what we have here. A bit thicker, a bit more flippy because of the size. And we can, you know, we can at any point just go and vary maybe the scale of these point replicates that we're creating. So we can sort of create slightly different results. Um, and that will just, you know, that will just give us another layer. It's all, you know, it's all it's about. Anyone that, you know, my students probably sick of me saying that, but it's all about just layering things up. It's about not trying to get everything in one effect. It's about creating layers to give you the detail or the specific areas that you want. It's very difficult to get everything out of the one simulation, especially when it's a simulation. Um, simulations are, you know, notoriously hard to control and to get exactly what you want. So you're far better to get what you want out of one simulation. And then if you're not getting the fine streams, try a different simulation and just, just combine. And, you know, you'll get there much faster than trying to force everything to happen in the one Uber simulation. It's just, it's just too difficult. There's nice things happening here where you can see the flip is actually following the surface of the ship. It's kind of adhering to the surface and clinging and sort of flowing under. So that's a really nice thing that we're not getting from our pop streams. So I think that's, uh, that's definitely worth, you know, worth it from this simulation. So now what we would do is take that simulation and do the same thing. We've got this transform here and we just apply that afterwards. And that's now going to move up with our ship. If we have a look with everything else, we can put that same coloration point vop that we had. We can put that on there as well. So if we jump out and have a little look, you can see we're still quite under the water at this point too. So uh, actually I'm not merging this one out at the moment. So let's, uh, Go back and just have a look at this. And it becomes a little hard to see when they're all colored the same, but there's our flip streams that are a little bit different. So it's kind of hard to see with everything going on, but you know, you can see that it's going to give a different look and just add a little bit of that nice flippy detail to it. So now I talked about um, potentially adding some pyro to this and we could, you know, we could potentially look at it in a similar way and just see it it might be useful as as just pyro to render it as pyro or it might be useful as a kind of um velocity field a guiding velocity field let's let's just have a look and see so we've got our point replicates here which actually might work well for pyro as well so let's what do we do i'm going to just clone this dot now 
and use what we have because we have a lot of things in here that we can we can utilize. And I'm going to also put an attribute wrangle down, create a density attribute, so at density equals one. And then I'm going to volume, volume rasterize, whoops, volume rasterize, can't type this morning. Volume rasterize attributes, density. And you will see that we get little spheres of density. So very easy to create an emitter. And then we're not going to use the flip solver, we're going to use the pyro solver. And we could, we could try the sparse solver actually, it might, um, might be a little faster. Let's, let's see. So we need a smoke object, sparse. Oops. And we've got a volume source here, so we can plug that in, but we're not sourcing particles, we're sourcing volumes. And we do have that plugged into the first input, which is good. So I'm just gonna, under operations, I'm just gonna add density. Density it is a scalar field, so that's good. Uh, all right, let's have a look at our sparse solver. See if we get anything, not yet. Um, what else do we need? So we've got voxel size 0.1. Let me just make sure that this is working. Density, density. Yes. Let's go to the output. Let's add in our object as well, our static object. So we'll merge that over. I don't often use the sparse solver, so I might be missing something, but let's have a look. Plug that in. And that should be there on the first frame, so that should be good. I'm just gonna set the center of this a bit lower, so it's already kind of around the ship. And let's see if we can get it to inflate now. Oh, there we go. Yeah, so sometimes with the sparse solver, I've noticed that you do need to kind of get the center in for it to then resize. As you can see, nothing's happening at the moment. And the reason is that we don't have temperature and there's no gravity either. So we could put a gravity force in, see if that starts to pull things down. We also might have under shaping, very high dissipation. So let's turn that down. I'm gonna, actually, I'll just turn it off for starters so that nothing dissipates. And then we should see, hopefully, there we go. We can see some things falling down. So now I've got some pyro sort of streaming off and you know, kind of looks okay. Just very smooth. So I'm going to go to shaping. I'm going to add disturbance. And what I might do as well is calculate speed field. So this will actually generate a new field, which is the speed at which the pyro is traveling, which is really useful for disturbance. So under control field, I'm going to turn that on and put speed in here. And what this will do is when the speed is low, zero, there'll be little disturbance, but as the effect speeds up, as the pyro speeds up, the disturbance will increase. So it's a really nice natural way of adding um, break up because it only adds it when the thing is moving really fast. Let's have a look. Now I used to do a similar thing where I would use the pressure field because the pressure field is greater when things are moving fast as well. But now that we have this built in to the pyro, the sparse pyro solver, it's, you know, it's a lot easier. So you can see now we're getting a bit of breakup there happening. We don't have those smooth shapes anymore. And when the, when it sort of stops pushing down, it's just sort of slowly moving. It won't be getting disturbance. The problem with disturbance when you don't have control fields is that it just tends to noise everything. So you do want to control where the disturbance is being added. So there we go. We've got some just very linear falling down pyro happening. Let's now, actually what I'll do is I'm gonna add temperature. So I'm just gonna take the density field that I have and I'm gonna turn it into temperature. And what we should see now is buoyancy. So obviously I don't want that. I don't want it to go that way. If I set negative temperature, it will fall. So now we've got some temperature as well that we can inject to make it fall faster maybe. You can see, you know, it's definitely sort of pushing a little, a little faster. I'm also gonna add to this 
let's take our points here and I'm going to do a point velocity node create a marker We've got V here already let's do keep incoming which is nothing and we'll add some curl noise so you can see that this is just going to throw these velocities out in random directions let's rasterize V as well and we'll add that to our volume source so it's a vector now it's velocity so it's a vector source volume is V target field is vel it's very important to get those names right so the volume rasterized attributes will just take the velocity name and make it a field called V but pyro expects vel so you need to convert that there V to vel but now we should see we get sort of things being thrown out a little bit and maybe a little bit more variation we could crank that value up just to make sure that it's actually doing something so it's looking looking kind of interesting let's go back uh, I might just take the voxel size up a little bit just so it's a little bit faster there we go so you can see it's still going to fall but hopefully just by having that curl noise in there we'll get a bit of variation into how those things are emitted you can see you know we've got some sideways kind of things happening don't want it to be crazy you know with any noise you don't want it to be too chaotic or too sort of swirly because it will start to look a bit magical and that's not what we want you know we're, we're going for realism so we don't want it to kind of look too magical but we would just want a bit of variation Arguably, you know, when things start going upwards, that's probably not what we want. We want this effect to be very kind of, you know, stuff coming down as if it's fine mist streaming off this ship. So what we could do there, we've got our point velocity here and you can see this is creating vectors which are pointing upwards, which maybe we don't want. Or maybe we want to minimize how much they're going upwards. So what we could do in an attribute wrangle is we could say v at v dot y oops v at v dot y equals clamp v at v dot y so we're clamping the value that we have between let's just say negative 100 and 0 now I've gone negative 100 just so that it definitely won't clamp any of the low values this could be you know negative 1 but you can see how that shortens some of the downward vectors. But if I do something high, then I can be sure that it's not going to clamp those vectors. But you can see what's happened to the top vectors. They've all been flattened. So another thing we could do there, instead of maybe we don't want to flatten them like that, one thing we could do is say if v at v dot y is greater than zero, so if it's in the positive, let's do v at v dot y times equals negative one and what that's done has actually just flipped those vectors so if anything if it does throw a positive value it's actually just going to flip it to point negative and then it's not clamping it to be a flat value so I think that actually works a lot better so you can see now we're just getting values that are pointing down we're still getting some horizontal ones which is fine but crucially we're not getting any of the up vectors so I think that I think that should work pretty well let's have a look so you can see now it's a few sideways ones and some of this will be because of collision but you can see we're not getting anything being thrown up now which is great there's some sideways stuff so you can see it sort of feels a bit like dry ice and we're very low resolution at the moment but I think that you know I think that's working pretty well now the other thing that we could add here to this is they're all very you know it's all coming from the same spot it's just emitting constantly from that one emitter so what we could do we have our um, our cull all the way back here so we could we could split these because this is driving the flip we could split this to a second one here so that we can control this slightly differently we've got our cull all the way back up here and our seed we could actually change the seed to change the position of the emitter 
but I think every frame would be a little bit too chaotic. You know, if I just did dollar F here, it's, it's changing so much that it, it's just going to be crazy. So what if we changed it every, you know, 10 or 20 frames? So what I might do there is do dollar F divided by, actually I'll do dollar FF so that it's a float frame. Actually, I don't, I don't know if that matters. Dollar F, let's do dollar F divided by 10. What you'll see, see as I'm scrubbing, so as I scrub, one, two, three, four is the same. And then on frame five, it changes and it will stay until it gets to frame 15. What's happening there is dollar F divided by 10 will yield a fractional number. But because this is a channel, an integer channel, it's only going to display integers or it's only going to round when it's an integer value. So basically what happens is $F divided by uh, 1 divided by 10. So at the moment, 1 divided by 10, you can see it just displays 0. But it it will be point, you know, point 0.1. So 1 divided by 10 is point 0.1. As we go through, we'll get 5 divided by 10. It's going to be 0 0.5 and then it flips over. So when it, when it gets to 0 0.5, it rounds to one and it changes. And as we go through, as we get to 1.4 and then 1.5, you can see it rounds to two. So we get this now staggered changing and we can control the amount by this value. So we could say every 24 frames, we want it to change. So you can see now we've got a much slower of swapping of that seed so that value we can make whatever we want and it will just continue to round through those seed values so you can see how that's rounding much slower so it's a really nice way of getting change but having it happen not you know not every frame um it won't be good if smoke goes in z axis rather than x axis uh i'm not sure what you mean by that Hardik. how do you mean so z axis is forwards x axis is sideways I want this to kind of be a streaming uh, type effect. So it's basically, you know, I want it to kind of be the same as what we, you know, what we had with the flip, just streaming down thing, but it's more of a, it's going to be more of a fine mist type effect, or I may not even use the smoke at all. It may just be a, um, a driving velocity field, but we'll just have to see what it looks like. So you can see now that we've got a changing emitter we're getting a lot more stuff happening. So, you know, there's a lot more stuff happening on the surface. I think my, my velocity, I've cranked it up to 10. So I'm going to turn that down. There we go. And maybe, maybe we don't need, um, temperature. Let's just set that to zero and see kind of what happens. Cause we don't want it to be a super fast effect. It is meant to be a finer mist. So, those tend not to, you know, they tend to be more floaty in the air and less sink, less fast sinking like the water would be. So there we go, much slower effect. Let's see what this looks like. So we're going to, again, dop import fields. Drag it up. Copy that path and we're going to do smoke object. Presets, uh, we're going to do smoke. So that's bringing out the density, velocity, don't have a rest field, we can get rid of that. We don't have a temperature field, we can get rid of that. We don't have a CD field, we can get rid of that. So just density and velocity. You don't have to use these presets. I could have just entered that manually as well. So we've got now our static smoke simulation. Again, we can use this transform to have it transforming with the rest of the ship. So I'll disconnect this one because this probably will resolve because it hasn't been cached. Let's have a look at these. Turn our velocity off. And where's our ship? Let's just bring our ship down as well. There he is. So it's super low res, the, um, the pyro at the moment, but you can see now all of those things sort of layered up together. Looks like the, uh, looks like this maybe is not in the right space. Let's see, what have we got there? Oh, I think it's just the res is a bit kind of funny. Let's, um, 
let's just take this resolution, increase the resolution. <laughs> no, no, which way to say that because it's increasing the resolution is taking the voxel size down. So let's increase the resolution by reducing the voxel size. Arguably as well, you know, we could do this without the ship there at all, but it is kind of nice to have a little bit of collision happening, but we could potentially just, you know, just not have the collision in there. It will go a lot faster. Um, and, you know, just use that, but it probably does add a little bit of a nice interaction by having the ship in there, especially when you take the voxel size down even further and it becomes you know, a little more high resolution, seeing a lot of those interesting details coming off the ship could be really nice. So now we should see, yeah, should look a little bit, a little bit more in line, still a little bit off. Oh, it looks like this ship maybe is, uh, maybe I haven't got the right, this is the time shifted one, that's why. There we go, that works a little better. So, you know, if I put a volume uh, volume visualization on here just so I can reduce that, make it feel a little bit less, I'll just take that density scale down. This is going to be a really subtle effect. It's just going to be a kind of, oops, let's go, I guess the ship isn't quite there yet. Let's go a little bit more on our sim. It's just going to be a subtle kind of misty effect. But what we have now is velocities as well. So these velocities could be really handy for advecting particles. We could feed them back into our pop streams if we wanted to. And that would be really handy to add a nice kind of interesting fluid detail. Um, so the way, you know, the way that we would do that, let's just have a look. So now we've got that. And we don't need it to, uh, you know, we don't need it to fall down super far. But it's good to have a little bit of, a little bit of latitude there for movement, and especially as this rises up, we want to see it. So let me just disconnect these particles so we can see it just with the ship. There we go. Can play with the ramp just to change the way that that looks. Okay. So this has velocities. So what we could do is take our pop net. I might just duplicate it so we have a completely separate one. And I'll plug this into the second input of my pop net here. Go back to the start. And let's turn off, what have we got here? We've got pop force doing gravity. We've got a pop force doing uh, some wind. We can leave all these things on, but I might just turn them off for starters. All this stuff is doing curl noise. And what's this one doing? This is affecting velocity with noise as well. So I'll turn those off. I'll put a pop advec by volumes down. And let's do second context because that's where I plugged the pyrosolver into, the result of the pyrosolver. The field name is vel. So we should have that there. Vel, there it is. And we can turn on the guide so that we can prove that that's working. Let me just turn the static object off for now. Uh, and this pop net is off the static ship. So I'll do this before the transform. We should see, there we go. There's the guides of our pyrosolver. So you can see that those are now affecting the velocities of these pop streams. So it's kind of crazy. It's a little bit wiggly. The more detail you have in your pyro sim, the more detail you get out of your pops, but we could also just, you know, add a little bit of variance. The higher you go with air resistance as well, it's like a kind of drag that gets applied. The higher you go with air resistance, the closer these pop streams will follow the pyro. So you can see we're getting very sort of pyro shapes out of those. Um, out of those flip, or out of those pop streams now. So it's a very different effect, but it might be an interesting one to add. We could also add a lot of variance to these emissions so that we just get like, 
maybe a very fuzzy particle stream so that this is like a really fine mist that's inside those um, pyro elements so it's kind of like we have the pyro mist creating the volume but then we also have this pop net so when we have a look at those two things together we've got you know we've got this and then we've got this and we merge our two things together and we get that so you can see how the the pop is kind of inside the pyro so it creates that nice you know when we render it it will create that nice feeling of little points little bits of spray inside the volume so i think that you know again layers it's just going to give us another element so i'm going to put a file cache down here and just copy so i'm going to just copy that path paste it in there and i'll call this one um, mist pyro v1 and i'll save out a little bit of that pretty quick it's very low resolution but we'll just take this now back to rendering and we'll see you know what we can um what we can get out of it does anyone have any questions while uh you know while i'm waiting for this any any questions or any any ideas for other streams as well if you guys you know have had some other ideas i've still got a nice big long list so i'm happy to keep adding things to it if you uh if you've had of had interesting ideas of things that we could work on um what uh what else have i got here oh someone someone in one of my classes um at cg spectrum recommended the or suggested the daredevil credits if you haven't seen those it's sort of uh it's a fluid effect of things being revealed um, with fluid which i thought was a kind of cool thing to go over at some point um but we have we have lots lots and lots of things here we go earthquake volcano black hole cool space effect planet colliding space debris achievable laptop effects that's definitely still something i want to look at lighthouse and fog with waves and wind i think that would be a cool one too building destruction we can definitely definitely look at something like building destruction uh, underlying skeleton muscles and gore effect i think that could be cool as well car crash someone recommended that in the comments i think uh, abstract effects always fun making something hairy that shouldn't be i think uh, was the was the complete uh, suggestion there glacier carving could be could be cool rbd sort of simulation with flip uh, and daredevil credits which is flip reveal effect um so yeah if anyone has any suggestions or other things that they'd like me to look at at some point you know i can't promise i'll you know, do it immediately but um i'll definitely be choosing something from these lists when i when i need a new project to work on so feel free to uh whoops whoops windows closed everything on me it's okay it's still going it's just horribly white now We'll let this go a little bit longer and just see see what we get. Probably, um, no, that's all right. Anytime, anytime. Um, you know, I probably could have made that go a little bit faster if I just set a max bounds, but actually this is just going to keep going forever, which is not really a good idea with Pyro. You know, it's just going to get bigger and bigger and bigger. 28 million voxels. It's not, not overly large, but it's probably... You know we just don't need this much because you can see when we rise this up like this we've got all this extra pyro that we that we just don't need you know so it's actually probably a better idea to set our boundary and i'll do that because it'll go a lot faster we have here this max size right so we can just you know x and z could be whatever they want but perhaps you know perhaps our y size can just be let's see what 20 does so 20 is going to give us 10 either side of our center here we don't really need it in in height but we do need it in depth we could take it down let's 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 try 10 that'll give us five either side it might be enough The 
And what happens when you don't have a boundary is that the longer it simulates, the actual, the slower it's going to get. So it goes really quick at the start, but as that size increases, it's just going to get slower and slower because you're solving a lot more. So it's actually, you know, a really good idea to sort of set limits so that you can keep a kind of consistent simulation time as well. It's really kind of handy to just keep your simulations consistent to the same amount of time per frame. You do end up with a little bit of a, even though this is set to open, so it should just pass through, because the velocity field kind of just disappears at that point, it does create the feeling of collision a little bit. So you can see that looks like it is sort of spreading out along that area there. And it's just because there's zero velocity when it hits that point. So it just sort of sits. But hopefully that distance below our ship is not going to be seen. If we jump out again. So we're still way below the way below the water at this point. All right, let's. Uh, I'm going to write this to disk in the background so I can keep keep on keeping on. So I'm going to hit save, save to disk in background, erase and replace, and that will uh, that will just run in the background and then I can keep working. Okay, open scheduler. I'll just keep an eye on that. All right, so let's also we're going to have to write out this one because it's dependent on this, so I'll actually change that to be there. So we'll write that one out next. Um, but let's, while this is kind of writing out, let's just set up a little shader for it. So to create a simple material shader, I actually have one actually for the foam that I created. So we can, we can just use that. I'll just duplicate it. I'll call this mist, whoops, mist volume. And just to have a quick recap on that, it's a pyro shader going into a compute lighting node. And I have my density here plugged into a multiply with a constant value that I can use to set the density up and down. And then I have the ability to make the smoke feel brighter. I can also take the shadow density down so that it doesn't have hard shadows. So it can be dense, but not be super shadowy. So that's good. So we'll apply that. Let's actually go back to our surfacing setup and I'm going to put a null here after my transform and say out mist. I'm just going to copy my volume visualizer here, create a brand new node, call this render mist. How are we going for time? 11 o'clock, one hour to go. Cool. Object merge, and I'll grab that from here. So we've got out mist. There we go. Paste my volume visualizer here. Not that this affects render, but it's uh, you know it's helpful for setting up the kind of look in the viewport. So there's our render mist, and hopefully this will just keep going. I'll turn some of these things off. They're a little bit slow see where we get to with this. There you go. So it's hitting the ground. So it's doing pretty well. It's at 54%. So it's probably about halfway. And there we go. So it's, we've got that much so far. Still <laughs> way below, way below the ground. You know, I mean, Probably we could start this simulation a little bit later, seeing as we don't see this effect until, you know, you could start it at like 100 or something, or, you know, maybe just around here so that we don't have to wait 78 frames. It's not, you know, it's not the end of the world, but it's always good to try and be efficient with your, you know, when your simulation starts, if you don't need to see it until a certain, a certain amount of time. I'm also just going to, go back to my file cache here and set this to no geometry so that it doesn't error when we go out of range. All right, so let's have a look at that. Still way below, but we can actually do some tests and I'll just duplicate this mantra node and I'm just going to render the 
mist. And we've got the water and the ship in the map. I'll actually get rid of the water because it's below the water and I'll just put the ship in forced objects for now. So let's try this one, mist. Go to our render view, choose mist, camera one, and hit render. And you can see the renders actually show up on this render manager as well. So sometimes if you're not sure that it's actually doing anything, you can check in the render manager and it will show you that there is something actually running. You can also kill it from here as well if you wanted to. Oh, we should hopefully be able to see something. Maybe our light is in the background, it is. Might just uh, go and turn that off for a second. Render light geometry, turn that off. It might be a little hard to see what's going on for starters. There's, that's our mist there, it's very, very kind of dense. You can see it's pretty slow as well, so let's go to our out context, go to rendering uh, pixel samples, I'm going to take that down to one. Stochastic samples are samples for transparent objects, so you can increase your stochastic samples, you can see now everything's very noisy. The mist is especially noisy, but if I increase my stochastic samples, let's go 32, you'll see my ship doesn't improve, but my smoke quality will improve. You can see how that's become less noisy. And actually the render time doesn't get affected that much when you use stochastic samples. So it's a really good way of smoothing out volumes without having to have much higher pixel samples. I'd probably take this up to two. The other thing that we can do is take the volume quality right down. Let's go 0.25 and the shadow step rate 0.5 and again we should see an improvement but in general we have an environment light here and environment lights are quite slow with um, well with everything in general but with volumes especially so you know maybe it's a good idea to think about not using the environment light for the volume itself it, it's really good for the ship and it's good for the water particles but for the volume itself it's actually really really slow so you know we could look at just replacing that with something else perhaps a spotlight or a sunlight we could try and figure out with our environment light where our sun is looks like it's over here let's stop down the light so we can see it it's uh Definitely over there somewhere. Well, that at least is our brightest kind of area. Can't see an actual sun in there, but you know, this is kind of our bright spot. So if I put a light, rotate around and put a light from the same kind of direction, I'm just gonna do a spotlight. And then I'm gonna do another spotlight from this side, just as a kind of fill light. So this is gonna be my key. And this is gonna be my fill. I go back to my camera, go to my out context for my mist, and under lights, I'm not going to do a star anymore, and under force lights, I'm just going to choose key and fill. And the ship is going to you know, look different now, but this render pass really is just going to be about the mist. So let's see, we'll have to change these lights. I just want to see what it looks like first of all. They're probably going to be too bright. There we go, so very bright kind of lights, but look how fast everything renders. So that's definitely the way to go with volumes, if, if you can, you know, and certainly for mist and atmospheric type effects, you don't need an environment light. So our fill light, we could try taking down. So you can see the fill light is actually doing a lot of the illumination and we're getting a lot of shadow from our key light. So the other thing I could do is turn down my shadow intensity from my key. And you can see now that it doesn't cast anywhere near as dark a shadow. A little bit of shadowing is good, I think. You definitely want some shadowing. But that way you get sort of transparent shadows, which are really important with you know volumes, especially when you're creating emissive volumes. 
Uh, and I don't know if I actually assign the material to this, so let's do slash mat slash mist volume. And that's going to have an impact as well. At the moment, it's just getting a default kind of shader. There we go. So that's really thick. Let's go back here and just set that back down to one. There we go. So that had a bit of brightness on the smoke as well. So that's just going to lift everything up a little bit, which, um, which helps. So there we go. 16 seconds. Pretty happy with that. At the end of the day, our render is going to be this for our mist. It's just going to be the mist. It's not going to be the ship. The ship will be rendered in a completely separate part. So yeah, I don't, yeah, I don't care that the lighting is different. Uh, well, I need it to match, but it doesn't have to be the same light. You can see if I add my environment light back in, it's just going to be really slow. It's going to, it's going to get up there to a minute at least. So definitely want to kind of try as much as we can to reduce that. And it also means that we can put our resolution back up. So, you know, pixel samples, and we're still going to have a pretty quick simulation or render. So I try, I try and avoid environment lights, especially with volumes as much as I can. There we go. All right. You're seeing some shadows, like some God Ray type shadows through here. Not too bad. Um, I don't know if our fill light is actually doing anything. Let's turn it off and see. I took the exposure down so much that it's actually not contributing. So try increasing it a little bit. We'll just fill in some of those shadowy areas a little bit. And again, shadow intensity, take it down. So overall, we just get a real bright... Hey, Alex, how's it going? Um, overall, we get a really bright kind of smoke. Because this is mist, you know, it's very transmissive of light. So it just, you know, it just lets a lot of light through. So it won't be super dark and shadowy. It'll be just nice, nice and missive. Hey, thanks for joining me, Alex. And uh, Muhammad as well, thank you. Would it be possible to go through compositing those render passes? Uh, yeah, sure. I mean, compositing in Houdini is not something that I do very often, although I have done it, you know, I've worked at places that didn't want to give me a copy of Nuke, so uh, I had to composite in Houdini. I can certainly, certainly do it if you're interested. Um, maybe I'll do both. Maybe I'll show you compositing it in Nuke as well as compositing it in Houdini. You can certainly do it in Houdini, it's just, you know, it's not a terribly nice compositing experience, um, but in a pinch, you know, certainly, certainly does the job. It looks like my pyrosim is now finished. Um, so let's let's have a look a bit further on and see see what that looks like. So we've got our mist. Let's go to 240. Hey, there we go. So it doesn't actually go out of the water all that much, but and certainly this would benefit from being higher resolution. But let's have a look at that. So hey, thanks for joining me, Alex. I hope you hope you're doing well. Alex, uh, Alex is the effects supervisor at Method, uh, who I've worked with for a long, long time. So we're in the, in the presence of, uh, great effects artists here. Um, so there we go. Let's add now back the water. So force mat, render water, and then we'll see where that sort of chops off the smoke. So you can see, we don't actually see a lot of it. But if we got this ship rising further, you know, if we got it rising further out of the water, um, we can, you know, we can see a lot more. And the de adding detail with having a higher resolution. So I'll do a high res over the week and we'll, we'll have a look at that next week. But um, I think it'll add, you know, I think it'll add something. Let's add in our, um, our particles as well. So what I'll do is I'll duplicate this geometry container and go object merge. Actually, we'll need to simulate it. So let's go back. Stop, 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 stop. Go back to our pop network that was dependent on our pyrosim. So that's this one here. Let's have a look at that. So this is gonna be our 
mist, our sort of fine misty points. And you could go crazy with the amount of points if you wanted, just to have like a, a ton of really fine points. That'll probably be okay. So let's duplicate that, call it pop mist. We're running out of room here, I need to make some more room. So pop mist v1, pop streamers mist, get rid of the streamers. And save to disk. This should be relatively quick. Actually, I'll do it in background just so I can keep working. There we go. I think that's probable. There we go. There's our scheduler. So there it is running in the background. And let's create another null. So I might just spread this stuff out a little bit. It's getting a little bit too bunched up. Get rid of this merge. All the way back up here. Let's see, shift. I can't remember which way, uh, which which version of L uh, does the align. Uh, shift L, I thought, I thought that's what it was. L is a horrible thing to accidentally push because it lines up your entire network uh, in straight lines and just completely ruins it. But if you do shift L, it will line up just the selected section. So that is really handy for sort of creating nice ordered networks. So we'll just get these happening in straight lines. That should be under there because it relates to the top network. And here's our ship. Okay, and let's move this one over here a little bit. You can certainly get, you know, a little bit messy if you doing a lot of things quickly like like I do quite often and very good at creating a big mess of nodes but in the long run cleaning it up will uh, you know will help I should probably just you know get rid of some of these connections use object mergers instead and that will kind of help with things as well there we go now I've got a little bit more space I should label some of these pop networks as well. Uh, all right, so let's have a look. There we go. There's our pop mist. Going crazy. Let's create a null here. And say our pop mist. Render particles, so we'll call render mist particles. Missed. We've got our P scale set up already to be random and also to have like another multiplier. And what did I do there? That's oh, so that yeah, so I have random streams of particles as well as random uh, per particle. So if we have a look, we should be able to get random PID. So you can see that's actually the streams, similar to what we did with the flip before. So that's the streams of particles that'll be different for each stream, but then we also have a randomization on the ID of each particle. So two levels of randomization there. Let's see, this one isn't transforming. I need that transform on there. So let's get that as well. So we'll put that transform on there. There we go. We don't have this flip version hooked up yet, but you know I can write that to disk as well, get that happening. So we've got now our, pit, our mist particles um, and our render mist. Okay, I should probably turn off that color. I don't want crazy technicolor particles. They're getting a lot of suction underneath the ship actually, which is kind of interesting. And perhaps, you know, having the ocean in there as a collider might be an interesting thing as well, so that we get it sort of spreading out on the surface. That actually might look really cool. Um, so I think I'll do that when I do a higher resolution sim. I'll try and put the ocean surface in there as a collider. Just the same as what we have for the flip. You know, nothing different going on there. But let's, let's check this out. So we've got the pop streams shader on these. Let's add it to our mist here. So render mist, we'll do render 
mist particles as well. Um, and I'll just turn off that color because that will come through. So let's just set that to white. Any view. Uh, it looks like that simulation's finished as well, which is good. And there you go. So you can see we've got little particles in there as well. So probably overall that could benefit from being uh, a little bit denser in terms of the particle count. We can play with the value here as well. We might be shrinking down too many of them. Again, this would be a separate pass. I would render this as a separate pass. You can see that I'm getting some shadowing on these, which I don't really want. Probably these would look maybe a little bit better with the environment light. So, you know, we would probably render the mist and then the mist particles as a separate render. So I'll duplicate that, call this one mist particles and just replace that, whoops. Place that one. Let's flick that over. And then let's change that to the environment light. It should be quite quick because they're very insignificant things. There we go. So you can see much less shadowing overall. I mean, we could add the uh, key and fill in as well, and that will make them even brighter. Um, but yeah, not really necessary. So there we go, we've got that. Let's go up to our test and the test is going to use anything that's called render. It's gonna actually grab all lights, which, uh, yeah, don't know. That's maybe, you know, maybe we'll just do the environment light for the test. So we've called these render. So everything that's gonna render here is gonna display. We've got our foam as well, which, um, you know, if you remember from last week was this kind of Flip turned into a foam volume. So we've got two of those. Let's have a look. I can't remember what the foam B was now. I think it's a smoothed version of the same thing. So if we have a look, there you go. So yeah, let's uh, let's see. Let's see what we got. There we go. So they're kind of the same thing, but one is smoothed out. Uh, all right, let's, let's see. We've got those in candidate objects, I think. So we can actually turn off these. So it will still respect, even though it's wildcarding anything called render, it will still respect the view flag being on or off. So let's have a look at our render test mantra node. a little while to calculate all that all that stuff oh our environment light i dropped the uh, intensity down to look at the sun and i forgot to put it back up that's why everything was looking a little bit dull so as you can see it's a little bit slow but that's probably down to pixel samples of three our volume quality we already have dropped which is good these aren't super nice, but having that at a higher resolution should really help. And we need to work on our water as well, so that's probably the next thing that I'm going to look at is to, one, get this to be an infinite plane out to, you know, the extents of our render area, and also to add, you know, detail to it. It's very kind of low resolution at the moment. So I'm going to do that with a displacement map. And I'll show you, I'll show you a version that will work, you know, whether you're doing this in Redshift or whatever renderer you're working in, you could do this technique to increase or to get the sort of tiling ocean surface displacement. So we can see there's our foam and our mist all coming through. Let's, uh, let's take the pixel samples down to one, see if we can get a nice fast render happening. There we go. Nice and quick. And we've got a few things turned off here. So I've got my particles turned off. I can turn that back on. And I've got the foam turned off. So maybe I'll turn on the flip foam B. Let's see what that gives me. Hopefully not a crash. 
Oh, there we go. There's our streams. They're looking quite nice. So it's nice to have that little fine detail from the pops in there. There's a ton of stuff going on. And at the moment, it's all just kind of, you know, not really sitting super well together. But because I'll be rendering these separately, we'll have all that latitude in the comp to make some things brighter or some things less bright, just to balance things out a little bit. You know, these missed points potentially they're a little bit large um so you know we can knock that back in the comp we can certainly do it here as well but uh it is definitely easy easy to take that stuff down once we have it in comp as well so it's possibly just the p scale of those i don't actually know which layer this is so you might just have to turn things on and off to find what that is that might actually be the flip that's that kind of uh, larger points And then I think the flip streams that we did today as well will really help just have an extra sort of nice flippy element. Um, none of this flip has been surfaced as well. So, you know, we could, we could look at surfacing some of this stuff to make it look a bit more interesting too. So yeah, we definitely want to get rid of this blobby pyro stuff. So certainly that will be, you know, one of the main things that I want to get rid of. And I think just taking the pyro resolution, you know, voxel resolution down, or voxel size down, increasing the resolution. All right, there we go. And let's let's see. Our phone doesn't appear to be rendering. Let's have a look. Out context test render. Let's have a look at our. So we've got our flip foam B, but maybe, maybe that volume is not dense enough. So 20, hmm. So you can see it's all the way out here. It's possible that it didn't get picked up when I hit re-render. Sometimes, uh, you know, what happens, I think I've talked about this a few times, is that when you're using this interactive renderer, sometimes it just doesn't update and it will just kind of either not render the thing that you added in after you've already started the interactive renderer or it will just kind of not update materials or something so sometimes hitting stop and render again i've just turned everything off except for the flip foam b just to see kind of what it looks like by itself um so yeah you do have to be careful a little bit with with the interactive renderer because it can definitely sort of uh give you a bit of a false read sometimes um Let's see what happens this time. It's taking a little while to think about it. But as I said before, you can see here, you could be tricked into thinking that nothing's happening, but I can see here, oh, there we go. I can see that it's running here. So I have confidence, you know, I won't, I won't cancel it just yet. All right, well, there's my phone. So perhaps it was there. It's just super, super kind of patchy. Probably this smooth is doing a lot of, you know, reduction in that volume. So let's, um, let's drop that down a little bit. Our pixel sample is very low as well. So, you know, this really fine detail stuff potentially won't show up um, as well as higher pixel samples. Typically when you're doing really fine things, um, you want more pixel samples to capture that really fine detail. Otherwise it can just get lost. Yeah, there's probably more detail here than what we're seeing, but all we're seeing is little, tiny little dots. Looks like this volume takes a while to um, to process before the render kicks in. So you can see it is running. Oh, there we go. So there's the smooth off. So we see a lot more with that off. Let's turn our water surface back on and see if we can see it now on the water surface before we couldn't at all. Mm. Oh, it is there. It's just very kind of very subtle. Let's turn on the flip foam as well. I think I think maybe I did have both of those things on last week and combined they they sort of create a nice, you know, effect together. Hard to tell. 
might hit stop and render again. Just see if I can force it to recalculate this one that I've added. See if it makes a difference, just, just in case. Just in case it is, uh, it didn't add that to the interactive render. Come on. Entra does take a quite a while to start up sometimes. Especially if that's a really large volume, just loading that in to the um, to the render file that it's creating it can take a while. Alright, here we go. Let's see if it's any different. No. <laughs> no different. Alright, well that's that's what we've got from our phone. Yeah, we can increase density and all that kind of stuff. Maybe maybe I just went too fine with this as well. You know, I've got this radius, very small P scales, so perhaps, you know, just increasing that a little bit will make it show up a little more. You can always do it here as a kind of global multiplier as well, so, you know, 1.2 on the radius scale there. We'll just we'll just bump that volume up when it gets created. I think the pixel samples are kind of not showing us exactly what we want to see as well, so that's that's a bit of a problem. Anyway, you know, we can see it. It's there. We can refine all these things. There we go. It's starting to thicken up a little bit. Part of it might just be that it's a little bit below the ocean surface as well. So let's take a quick look at the ocean surface before we run out of time. We've got our render water here. And here's our ocean evaluate, which is just a grid at the moment with, you know, our ocean spectrum plugged in and our division size of 100 by 100, which is pretty low. We've got our other grid over here, which is a higher resolution one. So if we plug that in, and look at our ocean evaluate, we can see a little bit more detail, you know, not loads. Let's, let's go a thousand by a thousand and we should see a little bit more detail. It's pretty flat ocean. So you know, there's only so much detail. Let me just make sure that's off. Yes. There's only so much detail that we're going to see there. But what I want to do is I want to create a grid that is low resolution and very large. So like this, and I want it to extend as far as my camera can see. So I don't want to see the edge of this ocean. There we go. Something like that. Now the question is, when I plug that in, that's going to be super low res. How do I get that high res ocean spectrum on there? Under the ocean evaluate, we have export to texture. And we can actually export a sequence of the ocean spectrum as a displacement map. So I'm going to do that. It's I'm not going to write out 240 frames. I might just write out uh, frame 240. So let's go to 240. And on our ocean spectrum, we actually have the resolution exponent. So the higher we go with that, the more detail we'll get and the more we'll get out of our map. Let's leave it at 9 and see what it looks like. So ocean evaluate uh, and save to disk. So it's displacement in RGB and that's all fine. Yeah, we'll just do save to disk. That's going to do something. I think it's already done. Let's have a look. Oh, it's created as a peak file by default, but uh, so there is there. I think I will do that as an EXR. Uh, let's save again. Should see it there. There it is there. Let's hit preview. When you hit preview in here, it'll open it up in mplay. And you can see there, we've got what looks like an ocean map in RGB. So you can see RGB. It's kind of like a normal map. It's only 512 by 512, so it's not super high resolution at the moment. Could increase the resolution exponent. I can't remember actually uh, if there's a way to 
change that resolution here. Let me have a look. Oh, max resolution, no. I think, yeah, let's just try save to disk again. That took a little bit longer. Oh, there we go. 1024 by 1024, so it's double now. Hey, Michael, how's it going? We are doing ship surfacing today. So right now I'm just looking at how to create a nice high resolution ocean surface from the ocean evaluate node and writing a uh, displacement map from the ocean evaluate. So now we've got a 1024 map, we could go higher if we wanted to, but let's try that. So what we've got here is our grid and this is actually going to be our renderable object. But in order to use this map that we have, we need to give this grid UVs. So I'm going to put a UV texture down and just do an orthographic projection from Y, which is going to be top down. So let's have a look at that with a UV quick shade. There's our grid. So if we have a look at our UVs, you can see they fill one tile. So let's go back to our scene view and we could actually take this map here, copy parameter, put it on our texture map for our relative, uh, a re relative reference in our texture map of our quick shade. And we can see that there. So the scale actually determines how big or how little these ocean details are going to be. So the amount of tiling that we get, oops. So, you know, if I said that to, well, that's pretty hard to see. I don't know if you can see that, but they're really tiny details there. 10 by 10 by 10, for instance, you can see that really fine detail that I'm getting. So we'll just leave it at one by one at the moment. And yeah, let's, let's see what we get. So we're actually just going to render this here and on my water surface, it's going to display all these things that I have turned on. Let me just turn this stuff off. There we go. So on my water surface under my principal shader, I'm going to go and find that. Let's call this water. And then we have displacement. So I'm going to add texture displacement. Maybe I can paste the same relative reference there. That's just going to give me the path to that map. So that if I update that path, this is just going to dynamically update. So let's go and do a test render of our water. And I'm just going to do render water. And I'll put that in forced objects actually. So render water. Let's check it out. My computer's making some noises, so it sounds like it's calculating something. Displacement can be a pretty heavy calculation sometimes, so do have to be mindful of that when you're, uh, you know, limited by RAM. Well, we've got an endless plane, which is filling our screen, which is good, but uh, no no displacement as yet. Let's uh, go back to our water. Let's increase the effect scale. Aha! Look at that. There we go. So let's set that to 1. So our displacement map is like, you know, when we're looking at just the grid displaced, it's pretty subtle. So one is probably good for this. So there you go. There's the ocean surface now being displaced and we can, yeah, we can play with that level of, you know, detail by increasing our scale here. So if I did two by two by two, you can see how that makes the details, you know, finer because it's basically tiling this map over, you know, having a lot more tiles so it shrinks that individual tile down so that they become much smaller details you will potentially notice some tiling although it's pretty good you know it's hard to see it is a tiling map so it can be a little hard to see and when we get our ship in there you, you won't be able to tell probably um so we can go back to our ocean spectrum here and just increase our resolution and update, save to disk. Because everything's relative reference or because everything's reading from the same map, it will just update. Oh, there you go, it's triggered our 
render to update. And you can see, it's a little bit hard to see with our low pixel samples, but the resolution has increased. So let's have a look. We'll increase the pixel samples to three, and then we should be able to see some nice fine details. And our grid that we're rendering here is this grid, which is just a default grid. It only has 100 polygons or 100 points, 81 polygons. If you increase the grid resolution a little bit, you will potentially get a slight improvement, <laughs> or not, um, a slight improvement. We'll just stop that and hit render again. You can see what happened there is it did that thing that I was talking about where the, the render file kind of fails to update and it just renders nothing. But we will see a slight improvement in our displacement when we increase this base resolution, but we don't need to go crazy high. Even 10 by 10 is kind of fine, but sometimes you know, it is good to have a base level of decent subdivisions. So there you go. Nice, detailed water. And I mean, our, our water isn't that detailed anyway to begin with. If we have a look at our Ocean Evaluate here, you know, there's not a lot going on there. Anyway, let's, uh, we'll increase this to 1000 by 1000 you can see that, well, it's, uh, it's gotten a little bit kind of choppy when I, maybe because I increased this resolution exponent, it's gotten kind of a bit weird. Um, let's take the chop down, see if we can get this to look a little better. Our speed is quite low, so it's kind of, it's quite flat. There we go. So you can see a bit more shape to it now. It's weird, the, um, the overlap that's going on there. Let's try it. Reverting that to default. Let's see. Ooh, look at that. All right. I'm going to just take these back down to defaults because it shouldn't really be overlapping like that. Wow, look at that. Mental. Mental. Why is it doing that? Why? I don't know why it's overlapping so much with default values. It shouldn't, shouldn't really be doing that. I mean, maybe it has something to do with the time scale that I've got there. But I basically do want a flat ocean. You know, I don't want it to be super, super kind of wavy. Let's just plug a new ocean spectrum in and see. See what that yields. Hmm, still super overlappy. I don't know why. It's weird. It doesn't I feel like it doesn't usually do that, but. Oh well, um, let's take the amplitude down a little bit. I've got some weird thing going on here. Maybe it's because of the um, non-uniform size, I don't know. Or maybe just too many subdivisions or something. You can see it decreases when I decrease the subdivisions, so yeah, I don't know, weird. Um, let's have a look. I kind of do want like some more recognizable, you know, larger shapes. So I'm just going to try and play with it a little bit to, to get something a bit more interesting happening. Uh, maybe my reference wind was just a little bit low. Take the resolution exponent up. So you can see as you, well, yeah, as you increase the resolution exponent, it just adds much finer details, um, but for visualization purposes, you know, it's not great. Let's just take this down. There we go. And yeah, I'll set this to 13. And so the, ideally what you would be doing here is writing out 240 frames of this EXR sequence so that it it is going to, uh, you know, be an animated ocean when you render your whole thing. I'll take that back down to 12. 13 seemed a little crazy. Save. I don't know what size this is saving out now. We'll have a look. It's taking longer. So there we go. Oh, it's 4K now. So maybe it goes to 8K when I go to 13, which is pretty high. So there we go. There's our UV texture. Don't need that material node. Let's have a look at this one. So we're still rendering this grid, which is our infinite one. 
let's take a look at that. I might get a bit more undulating surface now. Let's see. So this will work, you know, as long as you work out how to do this in Redshift or, or whatever, three to light, whatever you might be using, um, this will work. You just have to plug that displacement map into the correct slot and then you'll get nice displaced ocean. You don't have to do the, um, you don't have to use that ocean shader that you get when you create oceans via the shelf tools, which is, you know, in my opinion, pretty awful. Um, you can do it this way and you get really nice resolution. You can use your principled shaders or whatever shaders you like. You obviously can't do the shelf tool version if you're using a third party renderer. So um, this gives you a lot of options. So let's go and turn our ship back on or we can actually flip this over to, um, to the other renderer that we had, test. Flip it over to test, just hit stop. Let's go test and I'll turn on my ship and maybe my flip mist particles. All right, let's render that. So it's, it's looking a little better. It's got some, some undulating. The detail is pretty good as well. It looks, looks like a, you know, a large ocean. It doesn't look like we're super close to it. it. looks like we're kind of far away because of all those really small details which is important to get that stuff right. You know, the, the level of scale is going to kind of... Wow, look at that. Okay, so have I got the same shader on the ship? Let's see, shop material path. Let's check it out. There's some crazy stuff going on there. I don't know what's going on, but it looks like maybe I have displacement on my ship. Let's check my shop material path. I do have the water on the ship as well, so... That is not good. Looks like I've got these around the wrong way, maybe. Water. And... Yeah, looks like I did this on the wrong one. Alright. I'll just copy that. Paste relative reference. Actually, I'll just copy that. Don't want to paste relative reference to the shader. Uh, so that's a one. Okay, so this one is actually the water, this one is the ship. There we go. Let's fix that. And because I've got um, these split out now, originally I set it up as the same thing inside the, um, inside the render water node. So I'll just get rid of this material thing, these ones, so that I'm just setting it on the top level of the shader only, then it won't be confusing. Um, okay, let's have a look, hopefully that will have fixed it. 10 minutes to go. Has anybody got any questions, uh, you know, before I wrap up? I'll just, you know, I'll keep rendering this out, but if anyone's got any questions about this or anything else in Houdini. Um, let me know. Whoa! Crazy, crazy. What's going on? Shop material path's still there? Ah. Why? Where is that coming from? Okay, let's jump back to our ship here. And attribute delete shop material path. Okay, I'm going to hit stop and render again. That might that displacement might be baked in to the interactive IFD that's been created. So let's see if this fixes it. To be honest, this is a large part of why I don't use the interactive renderer because it it is kind of flaky. Um, although maybe it's me being flaky because it's still doing it. Why? Uh, oh look, I've got two ships. Uh, no. Hey Mitchell, what's the arcade cabinet? It is, uh, it is Rampage. It's a, it's one of those reissue ones, you know, that they brought out. 
Um, what the hell is going on here? Out ship. Well, that doesn't look right. my viewport. I'm just going to hit save and reopen this. <laughs> there we go. Um, yeah, I, I've been thinking about that too, Mitchell. I, I, for ages I've been wanting to do something like that. Hopefully that, hopefully I didn't lose that. Um, I should have checked that save file. Oh, no, it looks like it's okay. Um, yeah, I'd like to make my own cabinet as well. I actually have, like, an old TV that I want to put a screen, an LCD screen in and turn into a little gaming cabinet, which I think would be pretty cool. But, uh... Oh, so weird. What is going on with this ship? Looks like I've... Oh, wait. Maybe it's... I don't know. It's like it's getting, um... Because I've put the material on here, it's like the ship is getting displaced in the viewport, which is really quite odd. Um, render water is rendering this. This is my render flag here, so it should only be rendering that. And my render ship has my ship material on it, which uh, maybe I forgot to turn off the displacement. Yes, I did. There we go. I'm an idiot. Always forget to do something. Uh, Alright, so render view, test, camera. It's always something. I was blaming the interactive renderer, but really, it was me. Um, yeah, I don't play that cabinet very often, but it is fun. My, my boy, he's almost three, he's kind of, uh, he's almost able to play it he just wiggles the joystick a lot but hopefully he can he can get the hang of it and we can play it it's it's weird it's only got three joysticks though so it's kind of like if you had four people that fourth person would be kind of feeling a little left out it's also like a three-quarter size so it's not it's not super giant all right here we go well the ocean's looking good you know, maybe the angle needs to be changed to show a bit of sky. I think that, that could really help this shot. Um, but we've got a really nice ocean surface now, which is tiling. We can change that tiling if we want to. You know, we can do whatever we like with it. It's actually going to have affected the, um, the simulation. So we had flip pouring onto that collider for the surface. Um, you know, so that will, because we've changed that ocean surface now, that will have affected it, but let me show you something. What we could do, hey, Alan, um, certainly I can, I can talk to you about that. I mean, I tend to use nulls whenever I want to reference something. So, you know, uh, yeah, I, I assume you mean nulls inside the soft context, not at the object level, but yeah, I... You know, I will just use nulls to reference something. So, you know, you can see this is my main setup geometry container. And there are a lot of nulls in here because I need to reference these things. I need to reference these, for example, in the flip solver. And these things are being referenced in my render geometry containers. So basically just at the end, when I want to reference it, I will put out something. Um, is, that, is that what you mean? It's, yeah, it's a really easy way of being able to find things, especially because nulls and capitalized objects show up first in the object merge or in this um, choose uh, choose menu. You can see all of the outs, all the nulls show up first and then the capitalized things. So yeah, that's why I, that's why I do that because they're really easy to find. Uh, and by calling everything out, you know, you can just do dot dot slash dot dot slash out and then you get a big list of all the outs um, so here's our water surface which doesn't really match 
you know, what we have now in our render water surface. Also, it's pulling this um, kind of too high resolution exponent. Um, no, I think, well, I mean, you know, you can use nulls for all sorts of things when you want to create division, maybe. Sometimes some nodes have uh, two outputs and like a split, for example, and you can't actually see the second output. Um, so I might put a null there just to, so I have something to click on to see the second output before I do something else with it. But yeah, usually, you know, it's just handy for reference. Um, so I'm just taking that resolution exponent down on this one, just so I can see this water surface without it taking ages. So you can see now, you know, compared to what we had prior, this water surface has changed. But let's, let's say that we did our flip sim on like, you know, a ground plane instead, so that we don't have to worry about it colliding with the water surface, which potentially might change at render time or, you know, who knows. What we could actually do is apply that displacement map to our points. So in a point vop, we could actually bring in through a texture node. So we've got texture, we've got UVs. We don't have, um, we don't have UVs on these points really, but we could, we could create those UVs. We could actually duplicate these UVs here. So we can just copy that, paste it in here. We're going to set those to be point UVs instead. So you should see if I do spacebar five now and turn on my point display, there's my UVs. Hey, David, how's it going? You made it. So I've assigned the same UVs. So spatially, it should be kind of similar to what we have in the um, ocean surface. Yeah, I'm glad you could make it too. Um, and then I'll plug in my UVs now because I have them. And I'm going to promote my map. So the texture map slot here, I'm going to promote that and come out. Now let's go back out to our water. Now I'm probably going to go over time here a little bit, but I want to show you guys this. I'm going to copy this output file here and go back. Paste relative reference. So that's now bringing in that. That's weird. It's called mandrel, but that's now bringing in that displacement. If I plug that into color, we'll see that on the points. There you go. There's our ocean displacement. So that's cool. It's there. Now what do we do with it? Let's do a... Mm, let's see. We don't really have normals on these points. So I might just do a displace. Oops. Displace along normal, but we don't have n, but what we can do is just do a constant value. So I'll put a constant down, set it to a three floats vector, and just set one in y. So the normal is just pointing up. We plug that into n. P is our p position for our particles. And actually, this is a color, um, a color based displacement, not a vector based one. So actually, I think what we should do here, let's see, if I plug this into V and visualize this as a vector, it actually gives us, you know, direction. You can see that, you kind of see that wave shape where we get that nice scooped kind of shape. So actually what we can do is just add this to P and output P. Look at that. So now we've got a kind of water surface and it's too much. It's not kind of quite right. So what we need to probably do is multiply this by a value and let's do promote parameter there. And now we have the ability to kind of control this. And I think we have an offset in the texture as well. So the offset is actually going to be a subtraction. So we've got like this subtract promote parameter. If you have a look at the shader, whoops, to your context, 
If you have a look at the shader, we have an offset here of negative 0.5 and a fix scale of 1. So that is actually going to, let's see, where were we? Here. So we're going to subtract 0.5. I should label these so it's clear. Whoa, look at that. It's going, uh, looks like it's going the wrong way. Oh, you know what it's doing? It's actually doing it all in one vector. So that subtraction probably needs to just be in, you know, in that one axis maybe. So maybe that should be like a vector instead. And then I can just do negative 0.5 in Y only. I don't know. This doesn't look quite right to me. So I might have to, you know, try and fiddle with this next week. Um, but you can kind of see, you can definitely see that ocean surface in there. Now, the key thing here is that we only want to do this when it's on the surface. We don't want to do it on the ship. So really, we need to kind of limit this to just the areas that are on the, on the surface. And we could do that a number of ways. We could just do it via limitation. Like we could say if p.y is less than a certain value, you know, turn our grid on, figure out our kind of range here. Let's have a look, see where our numbers are. Where's our center? There. So here's one. So we could say like if p.y is less than 0 0.25, for example, then it will only apply to this stuff here. Or 0 0.1. So you could do that in a VOP. It's a bit easier to do it in a Wrangle. Um, but, you know, if you wanted to do it in a VOP, you could do something like compare. And a switch. Two-way switch. So compare goes into a two-way switch and then we could take the output of our add and then just our regular P position. This is kind of like doing an if statement basically in a VOP. And we could say if P, let's actually do a vector float. So we're doing P Y. So if P dot Y is less than 0 0.1 let's say and the way that this works is it says use input 1 if condition is true so if p.y is less than 1 then it's going to use our little displacement and if it's not it's just going to use the original p let's plug it in and there we go we can see something happening there so let's jump back here so you can see that some of it has been displaced and the displacement is crazy high i think this offset kind of doesn't work Let's turn that off. There we go. So let's change this. Um, let's change this compare less than 0 0.25, for example. So now we can see. Looks like it's working. It's hard to tell. There you go. So you can see just the stuff that's below 0 0.25 is getting displaced. And you could, you know, you could promote that promote that value there and just play with it. So you can see as I take it up, it adds that displacement further up the ship. So actually it looks like we could do like 0 0.3 or 0 0.4 would be enough. This value is too high. Need to figure out what, you know, what the appropriate value is there. And I can spend some time doing that next week for our rendering. Um, but there you go. So that's a way of adding in our ocean displacement and that you know as that's animating that will be undulating and changing but it's doing it post simulation so it allows us to have a nice flat collider we don't have to worry about having an animated ocean surface for the collisions just slow and we can you know have this dynamically update we can recache our ocean surface and that will just kind of um you know that will update so there we go hey thanks um thanks david so yeah, there's a lot, you know, potentially the lot still to do. There's a lot of rendering to do, but um, I think, you know, all the layers are there now. We just need to kind of bring it all together and get it, you know, get it working um, as best we can. So there's our, ooh, what have we got going on here? It's our render flip. So that's our, that's our flip that's getting merged out with the displacement. So we've got that in there. 
We've got our ocean surface, which uh, doesn't actually look correct, you know, in the viewport because it's not not the kind of correct one. But this is the surface that we'll be rendering. So those should line up in rendering, hopefully. Um, I think the offsetting I need to kind of play with a little bit. We've got our pyro. So I'm going to simulate my pyro to a higher resolution. I'm also going to simulate that extra flip one that we did early on in the stream, um, which was this one down here. So that I think will be a nice element. Should be some nice fluid details in there. And uh, next week we can just look at bringing it all together, finishing off some rendering. I might render out some passes as well, just to see what we have. And uh, we can talk a little bit about compositing and hopefully finish this one off, make some tweaks, and uh, hopefully, you know, we'll have a we'll have a decent, decent looking shot at the end of it. Um, so cool. It's Twelve o'clock. Time for me to run. Thanks again for joining me, everybody. Every uh, every week, I love uh, you know I love talking to you guys and showing you through this stuff and helping you know helping out with questions and whatever whatever you guys have. And you know, just to just to uh, reiterate, this stuff is not for CG Spectrum students only. It's for everyone. So please, you know, feel free to ask questions, and um, you know, don't don't feel like you can't just because you're not a CG Spectrum student. Um, and yeah, I hope you guys enjoyed it, and I'll see you guys next week. Have a good week, everybody. I hope it's not too hot or too cold where you are. I hope it's just right. <laughs> Um, cool. Alright, well, have a good week, everybody. I'll see you guys next week. No worries, Alan. Thanks for joining me again. Thanks, David. Thanks, Audrey. See you guys. See you, Hardik. <laughs>